Preliminaries. 1. Behind the hypnotic grimace of official pacification, there is a war being waged. A war that can no longer merely be called economic, social, or humanitarian. It has become total. Although everyone senses that their existence has become a battlefield upon which neuroses, phobias, somatizations, depression, and anxiety each sound to retreat, nobody has yet really grasped what is happening or what is at stake. Paradoxically, it is the total nature of this war, total in its means no less than its ends, that has allowed it to remain invisible. Rather than open offensives, Empire prefers more intricate methods. Chronic preventative measures, the molecular diffusion of constraint into everyday life. Here, internal police conveniently takes over for general policing, individual self-control for social control. Ultimately, it's the omnipresence of the new police that has made the war undetectable. 2. What is at stake in the current war are forms of life, which is to say, for empire, their selection, management, and attenuation, the stranglehold of spectacle over the public expression of desires, the biopolitical monopoly on all medical power knowledge, the restraints placed on all deviants by an army ever better equipped with psychiatrists, coaches, and other benevolent facilitators, the aesthetico police booking of each individual according to her or his biological determinations, the ever more imperative and detailed surveillance of behavior, the prescription by common accord against violence. All this enters into the anthropological project, or rather the anthropotechnical project of empire. It is a matter of profiling citizens. Evidently, impeding the expression of forms of life, forms of life not as something that would mold the material from the outside, material that would otherwise remain formless, air life, but rather as that which affects everybody in situation, with a certain tendency, an intimate motion, does not result from pure politics of repression. A whole imperial project of diversion, interference, and polarization of bodies centered on absences and impossibilities is at work. The impact is less immediate, but also more durable. Over time, and via so many combined effects, they ultimately obtain the desired disarmament, in particular immuno-disarmament, of bodies. The vanquished in this war are not so much citizens as those who, denying its reality, have capitulated from the outset. What they allow the vanquished in the guise of existence is now nothing but a lifelong struggle to render oneself compatible with empire. But for the others, for us, every gesture, every desire, every effect encounters at some distance the need to annihilate empire and its citizens. A question of letting passions breathe in their fullness. Following this criminal path, we have the time. Nothing obliges us to, obliges us to seek our direct confrontation. That would be proof of weakness. Assaults will be launched, however. Assaults which will be less important than the position from which they originate. For our assaults undermine empire's forces, just as our position undermines its strategy. Accordingly, the more empire will seem to be accumulating victories, the deeper it will bury itself in defeat. And the more irreme 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 irremediable the defeat will be. Sorry for that. Imperial strategy consists first of organizing the blindness of forms of life and their iller illiteracy when it comes to ethical differences, of rendering the battlefield difficult to distinguish if not invisible, and in the most critical cases, of making the real war in all manner of false conflicts. Retaking the offensive first side is a matter of making the battlefield manifest. The figure of the young girl is a vision machine conceived to this effect. Some will use it to account for the massive character of hostile occupation forces in our existences. Others, more vigorous, will use it to determine the speed and direction of their advance. What each of us does with this vision machine will show us what we're worth. 3. Listen. The young girl is obviously not a gendered concept. A hip-hop night nightclub player is no less a young girl than a burette tarted up like a porn star. The resplendent corporate advertising retiree who divides his time between the Côte d'Azur and his Paris office, where he still likes to keep an eye on things, is no less a young girl than the urban single woman, too obsessed with her consulting career to notice she's losing 15 years of her life to it. And how could we count, if the young girl were a gendered concept, for the secret relationship between ultra-trendy, muscle-bound Marie's Holmost and the Americanized petite bourgeoisie happily settled in the suburbs with their plastic families? In reality, the young girl is simply the model citizen as redefined by consumer society since World War I, an explicit response to the revolutionary menace. As such, the young girl is a polar figure, orienting rather than dominating outcomes. At the beginning of the 1920s, capitalism realized that it could no longer maintain itself as the exploitation of human labor if it did not also colonize everything that is beyond the strict sphere of production. Faced with the challenge of socialism, capital too would have to socialize, it had to create its own culture, its own leisure, medicine, urbanism, sentimentalism, 
education in its own wars, as well as a disposition towards their perpetual renewal. This was the Fordist Compromise, the welfare state, family planning, social democratic capitalism. For a somewhat limited submission to labor, since workers still distinguish themselves from their work, we have today substituted integration through subjective and existential conformity, that is, fundamentally, through consumption. The formal domination of capital has become more and more real. Consumer society now seeks out its best supporters from among the marginalized elements of traditional society. Women and youth first, followed by homosexuals and immigrants. To those who were minorities yesterday, and who had therefore been the most foreign, the most spontaneously hostile to consumer society, not having yet been bent to the dominant norms of integration, the latter ends up looking like emancipation. Young people and their mothers, recognized Stuart Ewan, had been the social principles of the consumer ethic. Young people, because adolescence is the period of time with none but a consumptive relation to civil society, Stuart Ewan, capitals of consciousness. Women, because it is the sphere of reproduction over which they still reign, that must be colonized. Hypostasized youth and femininity, abstracted and recoded into youthitude and feminitude, find themselves raised to the rank of ideal regulators of the integration of the imperial citizenry. The figure of the young girl combines these two determinations into one immediate, spontaneous, and perfectly desirable whole. The tomboy comes to impose herself as a modernity more stunning than all the stars and starlets that so rapidly invaded the globalized imaginary. Albertine, encountered on the seawall of a resort town, arrives to infuse her casual and pansexual vitality into the crumbling universe of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. The schoolgirl lays down the law and withhold Gom Proust's fairy duke. A new figure of authority is born, and she outclasses them all. 4. At the present hour, humanity, reformatted by the spectacle and biopolitically neutralized, still thinks it's fooling someone by calling itself citizen. Women's magazines breathe new life into a nearly hundred-year-old wrong by finally offering their equivalent to males. All the old figures of patriarchal authority, from statesmen to bosses and cops, have become young girlfied, every last one of them, even the Pope. Among its many signs, we recognize that the new physio, physio, physiognomy of capital, only an inkling in the interwar years, has now attained perfection. Once its fictive character is generalized, the, anthropomorphos, the anthropomorphosis of capital becomes a fate accompli. Then the, mystery, then the mysterious spell is revealed, thanks to which the generalized credit that rules every exchange, from banknotes to mortgage payments, from labor or marriage contracts to human and familial relations, from education and the diplomas and careers that follow, to the promises of all ideologies. All exchanges are now exchanges of dilatory appearance. Strikes within the image of its uniform emptiness, the heart of darkness, of every personality and every character. This is how capital's people increase, just when every ancestral distinction seems to be disappearing, and every specificity of class or ethnicity. It's a fact that doesn't cease to amaze that the naive, who still think with their gaze lost in the past, Giorgio Cesarano, Chronicle of the Mass Ball. The young girl appears as the culminating point of this anthropomorphosis of capital, the process of valorization, and the imperial phase, is no longer simply capitalist. It coincides with the social. Integration into this process, which is no longer distinct from integration into imperial society, and which no longer rests on any objective base, requires that every person permanently self-valorize. Society's final, final moment of socialization, empire, is thus also the moment when each person is called upon to relate to themselves as value, that is, according to the central mediation of a series of controlled abstractions. The young girl would thus be the being that no longer has any intimacy with herself except as value, and whose every activity and every detail is directed to self-valorization. At each moment, she affirms herself as the sovereign subject of her own reification. The unquestionable character of her power, all of the crushing assurance of this flattened being, woven exclusively by the conventions, codes, and representations fleetingly in effect, all the authority that the least of her gestures incarnates, all of this is immediately indexed to her absolute transparency to so-called society. Precisely because of her nothingness, each of her judgments carries the imperative weight of the entire social order, and she knows it. 5. The theory of the young girl does not simply emerge fortuitously when the genesis of the imperial order is complete and begins to be apprehended as such. That which emerges is nearing its end, and in its turn the young girl party will have to break up. As the young girlist formatting becomes more widespread, competition hardens and the satisfaction linked to conformity wanes. A qualitative jump becomes necessary. It becomes urgent to equip oneself with new and unheard of attributes. One must move into some still verdant space, 
Hollywood Soro, the political consciousness of TV news, fake neo-Buddhist spirituality, or an engagement in some consciousness-soothing collective enterprise should do the trick. Thus is born, bit by bit, the organic young girl. The struggle for the survival of young girls is from then on identified with the necessity to overcome the industrial young girl, with the necessity to move on to the organic young girl. Contrary to her predecessor, the organic young girl no longer displays the urge for some kind of emancipation, but rather a high security obsession with conservation. For empire has been undermined at its foundations and must defend itself against entropy. Having attained the fullness of its hegemony, it can now only collapse. The organic young girl would thus become responsible, ecological, in solidarity, eternal, reasonable, natural, respectful, more self-controlled than falsely, falsely liberated, in a word, fiendishly biopolitical. She would no longer mimic excess, but rather moderation in all things. As we see, when the evidence of the young girl attains the force of cliché, the young girl is already out of date, at least in her primitive aspect of obscenely sophisticated mass production. It is at this critical moment of transition that we enter the fray. So as not to give a false impression, which could well be our intention, the jumble of fragments that follows does not in any way constitute a theory. These are materials accumulated by chance encounter, by frequenting and observing young girls, girls as dragged from magazines, expressions gleaned out of the order of some sometimes dubious circumstances. They are assembled here under approximate rubrics, just as they were published in Taekwon 1. There was no doubt they needed a little organization. The choice to expose these elements in all their incompleteness, and the contingent original state, and their ordinary excess, knowing that a polished, hollowed out, and given a good trim they might together constitute an altogether presentable doctrine, we've chosen, just this once, trash theory. The cardinal ruse of theoreticians resides generally in the presentation of the result of their deliberations, such that the process of deliberation is no longer apparent. We figured that, faced with bloom-esque fragmentation of attention, this ruse no longer works. We have chosen a different one. In these scattered fragments, spirits attracted to moral comfort or vice in needing of condemning will find only roads leading nowhere. It is less a question of converting young girls than of mapping out the dark corners of the fractalized front line of young girlization. And it is a question of furnishing arms for struggle, step by step, blow by blow, wherever you may find yourself.